Hello. Welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel. I'm coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, and our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, drawing on the strengths provided by Digital Pathology Association and PATH Presenter. Uh, our index case today comes from uh, GYN pathology, uh, typical history, a postmenopausal woman with uh, bleeding and uh, evidence of an endometrial polyp on ultrasound exam. So next step, biopsy, sample the polyp. And here we see the fragments from this patient. Uh, as we can see at low power, uh, we have variable glandular dilatation and maybe some areas of maybe more busy uh, glandular tissue, some uh, mucin in the glandular spaces, some fragments that may look like they have uh, thicker walled blood vessels. Uh, so we uh, probably indeed are dealing with a polyp. And here we have more evidence of that, these nice thick walled blood vessels and sort of angulated, variably uh, dilated and uh, scattered glands of varying sizes. So uh, if we uh, had just this kind of material, this would be uh, ideal for a postmenopausal uh, polyp a little bit of stromal atrophy and so forth. Uh, but as we noted uh, at low magnification, there were some areas that looked a little bit different. Uh, here we see a little bit more uh, darker staining uh, tissue, a little bit more complex, but still with some uh, uh, variable size and shape. Uh, and nothing here particularly worrisome in these uh, glands in terms of cytology, a little bit of crowding, but uh, not terribly concerning there. Uh, however, as we come over here, uh, we see instead here something sort of stuck on the surface here that has a very papillary uh, pattern. Uh, and as we look at these cells, uh, we see that they look a little different uh, than those uh, elsewhere. Uh, these are smaller, uh, more uh, nucleus to cytoplasm. Uh, we see little tufts, uh, almost little hobnail type uh, projections in some of them. Um, and uh, we can see in a few areas, uh, nuclear debris, uh, evidence of higher grade nuclear activity and cellular turnover. So with this very papillary architecture, um, uh, we wonder then, and the accompanying nuclear atypia, we would wonder, is this uh, serous carcinoma, serous type adenocarcinoma, uh, or is this uh, an in situ lesion? Um, so we'll look around and see if we can find a little bit more of this uh, type of material. And sure enough, here's a little bit more right down here. Uh, again, very papillary, um, small rounded bulbs. Um, not a lot of slit-like spaces, but there are some here that we associated with serious, serious carcinoma. Uh, and again, we see uh, fairly high-grade nuclei here. Uh, so with the nuclear features, um, and uh, these findings, we would favor this being a, uh, a serous lesion. So then the question is, what classification does it fall into? Uh, because with serous uh, lesions, we have uh, two uh, sort of uh, baskets we can put this into, uh, which are illustrated here on this next slide. Um, is it uh, endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma? or is it serous endometrial, endometrioid carcinoma? Um, so this uh, EIC is defined as replacement of the surface epithelium or underlying glands by cells resembling serous carcinoma in the absence of stromal invasion. So certainly on the surface of this polyp, we have not seen stromal invasion. Uh, could this be serous uh, carcinoma? Well, to call it that, we should uh, generally see features of invasion. Uh, so is this an important distinction? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, if we look at follow-up data, uh, it turns out that these lesions on resection can be staged um, and that there are a number of cases where we in the uterus only find uh, endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma, no destructive invasion. Uh, but yet the patients are stage four. They have disseminated peritoneal disease, nodal disease, and they have a terrible outcome. This is uh, uh, disease-free survival, and this is overall survival. Uh, they do uh, as poorly uh, as the patients with uh, invasive tumor. Uh, if we look at the stage one patients, uh, 
A uh, similar story with maybe a slightly different uh, outcome uh, over the long term, over the 10-year the haul. But over that first, uh, you know, four to five years, uh, it's really close up here. Um, and so endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma, uterine papillary serous carcinoma, both of these are serious, actionable diseases that potentially threaten the life of the patient and need to be managed with appropriate uh, therapy, uh, be that surgical or chemotherapy or uh, some combination thereof. Uh, at the very least, they need to be staged. So uh, these tumors, um, in contrast to the normal uh, pathway, maybe the, the type one pathway, are tumors that follow along this, uh, this pathway, the type two pathway where from a normal surface, we may get some sort of a P53 mutation with accompanying loss of hormone receptors, resulting in a serous uh, neoplasm. Uh, and there may be some sort of uh, endometrial, uh, uh, you know, just dysplasia type of lesion. It's uncertain whether this intermediate stage exists or not. It, now, to complicate matters, we also have things that cross over from uh, beginning with a P10 mutation in a pre-latent cancer precursor or endometrial uh, intraepithelial neoplasia, uh, as opposed to carcinoma, um, and ultimately invasive adenocarcinoma, or the type 1 tumors, which are hormonally positive, um, P53 negative, and uh, so forth. Now, some of these from either uh, the uh, EIN hyperplasia stage or from adenocarcinoma uh, can have uh, late uh, uh, P53 inactivating mutations uh, that result in a serous uh, phenotype. And hence, we see combinations of serous and clear cell, serous and endometrioid, and so forth. Now, to make uh, our particular case even more interesting, uh, although we had uh, morphology that looks uh, for all the world like EIC, uh, we could not detect a P53 mutation. We did have loss of ER and PR, uh, and so we're, we're somewhere along this pathway, uh, but not yet uh, perhaps fully developed uh, in this situation. So a lot of times uh, we wonder about these classification schemes and our difficulties with this. Um, and uh, the truth is, is this has been a problem for a long time. Uh, since uh, well before the WHO classification in the mid-90s, uh, which used a simple complex uh, with and without atypia as a means of creating four baskets uh, of precursors uh, and uh, benign and carcinoma at either end of those uh, precursor lesions. Well, we didn't do very well with this. As you can see, consistency of di diagnosis among and between pathologists, uh, even within pathologists, uh, only 28%. Uh, if you s slice that down to two categories, benign and hyperplasia without a a atypia and atypia, atypical hyperplasia and carcinoma, well, we get up to 70%. That's much easier uh, because all of these uh, very, you know, differences between this and this uh, get wiped out. Uh, the uh, endometrial intraepithelial uh, neoplasia camp uh, tried to uh, deal with some of the problems from this 94 WHO and, and go in a slightly uh, similar direction by condensing these categories into uh, benign hyperplasias and endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, but still separated off carcinoma. And while that improved classification, still not as uh, optimal as we might uh, um, prefer. And probably I'm going to guess that uh, most of the differences are right here, um, because that seems to be the area based on our consultation practice where most people have difficulty uh, distinguishing or categorizing this, uh, and therefore the consistencies are, are present. Uh, if we take their category and go down to two categories, lump these two together, uh, once again, we jump up in near 70%. And the same thing is true with the European classification where their working group uh, took uh, a uh, three classification uh, schema, uh, got it to 60%, uh, and then by uh, nixing the line between benign and, and hyperplasia, uh, got well over 72%. Um, so uh, I think these are be believable results. 
And as somebody said, yes, by, by racing the lines, everybody can play tennis. By taking down the net, even more people can play tennis. Well, uh, uh, that's essentially what we're doing here. But in terms of management, uh, which is really what matters, uh, it turns out that these, uh, these categorizations down here uh, don't make a whole lot of difference. As long as you know which side of this line you need to be on, uh, these are the ones that require action. Uh, these uh, do not require the same level of action or follow-up. So uh, having uh, gone through that, I'd like to give you uh, my clues. Uh, while I still labor in the, uh, in the category of trying to differentiate atypical hyperplasia from adenocarcinoma, uh, because frankly, people want to know, uh, and sometimes the name will make a difference in terms of patient compliance and so forth. Uh, these are the things that incline me one way or the other. Um, now, by definition, atypical hyperplasia, or EIN, has been defined as uh, greater than 50% glands to stroma, usually more than three to one, uh, cells that are cytologically different than the normal surrounding endometrium. Uh, therefore, they're different in the sense that they have enlarged nuclei or nucleoli, a more coarse chromatin and some level of maybe stratification or loss of polarity, and a size greater than one millimeter, and appropriate mimics have been excluded. Now, it would be wonderful if we had an immunohistochemical stain that would tell us when you cross that line from benign hyperplasia into hyperplasia, uh, but uh, so far, not, not so good. Uh, while P10 was promising, it has not uh, proven to be uh, definitive uh, in uh, longer term and uh, greater uh, follow-up studies. Now, what moves me from calling it atypical hyperplasia and saying this is definitely endometrial adenocarcinoma grade one? Well, um, when I see increased, even further in class, increased uh, glandostroma ratio with lots of back-to-back -back glands, and I start seeing very complex architecture with extensive long glands, and especially if we see any area of solid growth, uh, aside from squamous metaplasia, uh, we're going to call it uh, endometrial adenocarcinoma. Um, there are additional findings that are, can sometimes be helpful. Um, finding stromal histiocytes, uh, the foamy histiocytes in the stroma, which are found in about 15% of cases, I, I think also is a greater uh, marker for carcinoma than for hyperplasia. Uh, finding areas of luminal necrosis, uh, again, I think uh, bodes more likely to be uh, uh, carcinoma than hyperplasia. Um, and uh, that is uh, not, again, not, not found in every case. And I have seen cases that people have called uh, hyperplasia that had only luminal necrosis. Uh, what we do not call uh, solid growth, however, of course, is uh, um, squamous metaplasia. So let me uh, take you through a couple of cases and just illustrate uh, how, we, how I try to apply these uh, sorts of uh, criteria. So here's a case, uh, came in as curettings, um, you know, perimenopausal bleeding, uh, is this hyperplasia or not? Um, and as we can see, much of it uh, doesn't seem to have an increased glandostroma ratio. A lot of these areas show uh, very benign, uh, small, uh, widely separated glands in a sort of proliferative pattern with a fairly compact stroma. So this doesn't look like hyperplasia, it's barely proliferative. Um, what we do have is we have a fragment here that looks a little different, see the stroma is different. Um, and we have another fragment over here, nicely dotted, again with a slightly different stroma and we can see more uh, gland, you know, variability of the glands and uh, a little bit more tighter spacing. So is this hyperplasia? Well, from low power, I don't think we're quite to 50% uh, glands to stroma. Uh, we do have some solid areas here, uh, but as we look at this, uh, we see that this is uh, squamous morular metaplasia uh, in the lumen of some of these uh, glands. Here you see it uh, in the lumen here. That does not define dy dysplasia any more than it defines carcinoma. But we're getting a little bit of fenestrated growth and uh, variable size and shape. So let's look at the cytology. Uh, are these cells uh, in this area cytologically different uh, than the cells? Well, they're, they're, they're compact here. There's a little bit of a variability in the glandular architecture, but the nuclei have polarity. They're all, most all basally oriented. Uh, 
uh, there is some sort of a, a, a nucleus free zone towards the lumen. Um, and though the nuclei may be slightly enlarged, they don't look particularly atypical. So let's compare that to, say, this area over here where we have um, maybe something we'd say is more normal uh, type endometrium. Well, again, we have basally oriented nuclei. We have a little bit of crowding and so forth. Uh, to me, these glands don't look uh, very different from here or here. Um, so um, if I were applying the criteria, I would say this is a, a benign hyperplasia. This is not atypical hyperplasia. We have squamous morular metaplasia, and this may be occurring uh, in the setting of an endometrial polyp, because if I look right here, I can see this same process, and I see some rather prominent thicker walled blood vessels uh, that, again, look different than the surrounding endometrium, uh, but are not uh, hyperplasia. So this would not, for me, fall into the camp of atypical hyperplasia uh, and would not warrant uh, further surgery or particular follow-up. Uh, now let's look at a case that obviously uh, was uh, excised um, and how would we apply the criteria here? Well, uh, we certainly see an increased gland to stroma ratio here. Uh, we see that uh, these glands have uh, uh, fairly abundant mucin uh, and all, you can get that uh, sometimes in hyperplasia, although usually not so much. Um, there's a variability. Uh, there is still some remaining stroma uh, in between some of these glands. Uh, and as we look at the uh, cells themselves, they're not particularly atypical. They're mostly basally oriented, but and this is an important marker. Uh, they're beginning to round up. So they're not quite as... Uh, uh, cigar-shaped or tubular, uh, they've begun to round up and they begin to produce some sort of complexity into the lumen. Um, so even though we still got stroma in between glands here, and here we see uh, the difference between a normal gland or residual gland and these uh, uh, hyperplastic or carcinomatous glands, and it's quite marked. So that's not a hard distinction to draw. Uh, we can look a little further. Um, and although we don't see necrosis here, uh, as we look a little bit further, we can see some of these very uh, elongated and labyrinthine glands. So when we start seeing glands that look like this, um, and here we can see almost a little bit of cribriform type architecture, uh, this is a gland that has crossed into being adenocarcinoma. Uh, additionally, uh, as we look at some of these areas, we can see that um, you know, we're losing the lumen. Um, and so we're beginning to get more solid type growth. Um, and in some institutions, uh, ours included, when you begin to see this type of back-to-back uh, -back, uh, glandular tissue within the gland, uh, that begins to define solid growth. Uh, when you still see a few slits here and there, maybe not, but you'd like to see white space uh, to define them as grade one and open glands. Uh, and here we see that, uh, in fact, uh, we focally have grade two nuclei uh, in this lesion, uh, which would probably move this up to a grade two, uh, even though um, this is still an in situ lesion. Uh, as we'll take a look right here and just reiterate uh, one of the points we've made before, uh, this is not myometrial invasion. And why is it not? Because right here next to it, right here, right here, and around this, we have endometrial stroma and benign adenomyosis type glands. So this is still carcinoma involving adenomyosis. This is not in myometrial invasion. Now that's not critical because uh, the management of endometrial hyperplasia like this, endometrial adenocarcinoma with uh, minimal invasion uh, is virtually the same. And so uh, it, it's not a critical distinction. As long as you're less than 50%, uh, the statistics are favorable. Uh, the follow-up is uh, relatively bland. Uh, and patients with this disorder can uh, do very, very well. So let's take one more example and, again, run through those criteria. So here's, uh, again, sort of a polypoid lesion. Uh, we can see that it's rather complex. Uh, it's mostly glandular. Uh, and as we look at it here, we see that these are indeed mostly back to back. Now, there is a little bit of stroma here in between. And again, we've got this 
hallmark vessel indicating that we're in a polyp or a polypoid lesion. Uh, as we look at these glands uh, on higher magnification, they still have polarity, the nuclei are still basally located, uh, and even though they're back to back, uh, there's not a high degree of nuclear atypia here. Uh, but what we do have is we do have very large glandular spaces that are truly labyrinthine, uh, where these glands, this is essentially all one gland, just like this is essentially all one gland here, uh, and this would be much larger than one would like to see in endometrial hyperplasia. Now, in a case like this, we also want to look at the surface and make sure we don't have, you know, higher grade lesions. We don't have that P10, or excuse me, that uh, P53 mutation that's giving us a high grade lesion, uh, but we do not see that. And so again, this would barely slip over the category into endometrial adenocarcinoma grade one. Um, and not be uh, classified as endometrial hyperplasia, even though it still appears to be uh, probably in situ, or maybe totally confined to a polyp. So uh, there's our discussion for today. Uh, our uh, signal case was endometrial in intraepithelial carcinoma, um, close relative of uterine papillary serous carcinoma. Uh, and we use that as the launching point to talk about uh, the differentiation of type one tumors uh, from endometrial hyperplasias, benign endometrial hyperplasias, atypical hyperplasias, intraepithelial, intra excuse me, endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, and grade one uh, endometrial carcinomas. That's a lot to cover, and I'll, I'll try to show some additional uh, cases as uh, uh, we encounter them to uh, enrich uh, your experience with this, because I think this is a difficult area uh, and one that it's important to, to feel confident in uh, as you uh, share your cases with colleagues. So that's our, our program for today. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we welcome your comments. And if you like this, please uh, please leave us a like and a comment. Uh, certainly, we hope that you'll also subscribe so that you don't miss future offerings uh, from our channel uh, in the days ahead. And until then, thanks so much for joining us.